Hello and welcome to this event. This podcast is sponsored by the American Meteorological Society to celebrate 150 years of the journal Monthly Weather Review. My name is David Schultz. I'm a professor of synoptic meteorology at the University of Manchester. And since 2008, I've been the chief editor of Monthly Weather Review. And it's my honor to serve as the moderator for this event. Before we get started, I want to acknowledge the support of the AMS, Lance, Vince Idoni, and others here at the State University of New York at Albany who worked to make this event happen. We're recording in front of the live studio audience. Audience? <laughs> <laughs> We're at the new E-Tech building on Albany's campus. Comedy so, hour. <laughs> so on to our event. On 18th and 19th February 1979, a rapidly developing cyclone moved up the east coast of North America, eventually dumping up to 60 centimeters of snow in eastern Virginia, Maryland, and Delaware. The National Weather Service was caught unawares with the operational forecast models at the time missing the cyclogenesis event entirely, and therefore the public forecast omitted references to the possibility of heavy snow. As the storm happened on the President's Day holiday in the U.S., the storm became known as the President's Day Snowstorm. Now, 18 months later, in September 1980, Professor Lance Bozard of the State University of New York at Albany would submit a paper to Monthly Weather Review in which he performed a meticulous analysis of the observations studying the storm's development, uh, the failure of the operational models to capture the event, and the mesoscale conditions for the heavy snow. That Monthly Weather Review article, which was Bozart 1981, and a subsequent one by Bozart and Lynn 1984, showed that the preconditioning of the environment by fluxes from the ocean produced the conditions favorable for the rapid cyclogenesis and the absence of latent heat flux parameterizations in the models likely contributed to the forecast bust. At the same time, another person in a different state was taking up interest in a storm. Louis Uccellini was working as a research meteorologist at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland. His PhD research at Wisconsin focused on the association between localized wind maxima in the jet stream, called jet streaks, and weather phenomena such as convective storms and cyclogenesis. He lived through the President's Day storm, the incredible four to five inches per hour snowfall rates, and the busted forecast. In September 1982, he and his colleagues submitted the first of what would be five papers on the President's Day snowstorm in an attempt to understand the synoptic scale mechanisms for the cyclogenesis. The resulting back and forth in the literature between these groups, the conferences, and surely what must have happened by phone, <laughs> became the stuff of legend fueled by these two very big personalities themselves. <laughs> From a scientific humble, perspective, humble, 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 very big, humble personalities. I'll make a note of that. <laughs> From the scientific perspective, the debates between the relative importance of diabatic processes versus dry dynamics to extratropical cyclogenesis between the Beaux-Arts and Uccellini camps ushered in now standard analysis approaches such as frontogenesis, quasi-geostrophic and semi-geostrophic analysis, ageostrophic circulations, model verifications against observations, potential vorticity, and air parcel trajectories. These analysis techniques were not only useful in research, but worked their way into operational forecasting as well. Now, more importantly, the discussion that they initiated fueled research interests in extratropical cyclones, the rapid development and the associated precipitation. As a result, another outgrowth of this early research on extratropical cyclones was investment from the National Science Foundation and the Office of Naval Research in understanding the causes of these cyclones, leading to field programs with such acronyms as GALE, ERICA, and Ocean Storms, as well as further study on the synoptic and mesoscale meteorology of these cyclones. This research persisted as a hot topic for the next few decades. The President's Day storm helped to open all sorts of research and educational doors, jump-started the funding for cyclone-related research, and resulted in the creation of the Cyclone Workshop, what Lance calls a true research progress trifecta. 
Now, in this way, the research that was published in Monthly Weather Review during the 1980s helped to define our discipline. It helped to motivate, uh, it, to motivate the need to mobilize these resources for research and to promote new research methods and to serve as the venue for scientific debates. Moreover, from the perspective of Monthly Weather Review, this debate and the resulting purposes, papers, raise the bar on future submissions to our journal and its credibility. It was becoming less fashionable to write a purely descriptive paper showing some surface maps with frontal waves, um, some upper level maps with some Rossby waves, and a lot of hand waving speculation. This series of papers arising from this scientific uh, robust discussion elevated synoptic meteorology to a more rigorous framework and we are all benefactors of this effort. So, revisiting the President's Day snowstorm with the two principles in this story helps to tell a little bit of our story of the Journal of Monthly Weather Review as well. So with that introduction, let's introduce our two guests for this podcast, Meredith Professor Lance Bozart of the State University of New York at Albany and Dr. Louis Uccellini, the soon to be retired Director of the National Weather Service. Please welcome our guests. First, briefly, I'd like to hear the stories of what got you interested in cyclones in general and the President's Day cyclone in particular. One of you want to start? Well, I was interested in uh, cyclones from an early age for snow. And you never knew what was happening because the forecasts were clowns on TV at the time. There was no internet, no data, um, and so on. So I would dial, uh, there's a phone number I remember to this day, WE61212. We were talking about that at dinner last night. No, no, none of the younger folks knew what the hell we were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and I dialed well, well, six, zillions one, two, of one, times. Two. Yep. Same here. You knew when they would update the forecast and everything like and that. And you were living where at the time? New York. New York. York area. All right. Louis? Yeah, so similar story, actually. Um, always interested in uh, the weather. For parents said even before I was talking, it was pointing up at clouds. Um, but as a young kid uh, on Long Island, um, uh, you know, interested specific, especially in snowstorms, um, and um, had the, the joy of watching Hurricane Donna pass right over our house in 1960. Uh, so, you know, weather events like that kind of locked it in, but it was the winter of 60-61, you know, with three snowstorms, uh, was really my first solid memory of, uh, of what it could be like. And of course, I believed it would happen every year, you know, which it did. <laughs> right. But, um, you know, we, there were, it was interesting, you, we, the weather 61212 was our only way to update, you know, and we, as kids, we kind of figured out you know, when the weather uh, bureau was up, would update a forecast right around five o'clock, never exactly the same time, but if we were waiting for that four inches or more in the forecast, we were pounding that phone, um, <laughs> you know, until we got the new forecast right. you know, ahead of time. So that's the kind of interest that uh, yeah. I had in a friend of mine who uh, never graduated from high school, by the way, but I think it's the only person that's read the uh, snowstorm monograph from cover to cover because he's asked me the toughest questions <laughs> from the coast and the neutral anyway. Mm -hmm. he, was, he was with me every step of the way as I was growing up in this. Mm -hmm. And he's still a weather freak mm -hmm. today. So. And a cri yeah, the critical thing for me was Hurricane Hazel. I was a little kid, and I can still remember to the day, Hurricane Hazel went west of New York. It gave Toronto, Canada the, hot, the strongest wind speed ever observed in, in, in Toronto. And, but the rain, hardly existed. It went west of New York City, very windy. It rained for about 45 minutes. And I went to my, I remember asking my mother, why is it raining only a short time? She said, I don't know, go ask your father. <laughs> so I asked my father the same question. He said, go ask your mother. <laughs> so what's a kid supposed to do? I just went arg. <laughs> because there was no, there was no way that the encyclopedias were useless. There was just no real weather information. Where I learned my meteorology as a kid was from the New York Times, weather tables. The chip, they, they had the high and low temperature, and they had from all around the world. For example, I would notice that in New Delhi, India, it was always hottest in May. Why is it? Didn't know anything about the monsoon. It wasn't an encyclopedia, couldn't figure it out, but it was always the hottest in New Delhi in May, but not in July. What the heck was that all about? And so by watching all the, watching all the things from around the world, I learned, I learned basic climatology from 
the details weather observations in the New York Times. They actually had a weather map with data plotted on it. Same thing here. So I, um, my, it was either my mother or my uncle got me a, a, one of these uh, weather stations that had a barometer in it, hygrometer. I don't know if that worked or not. But barometer, I realized, was really important. But I wanted maps, and the only maps that were available was in the New York Times. And of course, that was for you know, the day before, basically. So that was, um, so I told my parents, I want, I want to get the Times. They said, fine, you buy it. <laughs> so, because it wasn't, you know, we were, um, you know, we, my father made sure there's food on the table, mm. right? So, so the thing is, I did, it was a dime a day, and that was a big deal. So they, they were, actually, that's what they told me later, that was the first clue that they had an odd child. <laughs> so, um, so that, you know, because everybody else, you know, they, they weren't talking about weather or meteorology. Uh, I was the only one in the household doing that. Mm. So, um. Yeah. So, 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 so when he just mentioned the times, I said, Jesus, you know, <laughs> it's the same story all around. And I took daily obs, you know, mm. that, I still, I still got them in a the box somewhere. My parents, when I was out in Wisconsin, my parents brought a whole box out that had my baseball cards, the daily obs, and, and they brought my set of drums. They just wanted to get it the hell out of the house. Right. So it was, um, but I had those, I still got those obs mm. and yeah. the stuff. So. And so what was your experience then that led, I mean, where were you during the president's day storm? So we live about 20, 25 miles north of D.C., so right smack in the middle of Maryland. And um, uh, it was kind of interesting. I, and I had just arrived at Goddard Space Flight Center the August before, so August 78. And it was just me uh, dealing with Synoptic. I had three contracts that I had to monitor. Mike Kaplan's model, Rick Anthony's model, and Carl Kreitzberg's model. So I had three folders. And... Um, that's what I was starting with. Um, I was working on hybrid modeling at the time. I was going to do some of that. And then the President's Day storm happened. And uh, we knew, wait, we knew it was, we had a chance for snow that Sunday. It was very cold February. The first half of the yeah. month was very cold. Yeah. And we'd had three snows, and it was snow on the ground. Very un so it's, first of all, it's unusual to get snow on snow in, in that part of the country. We still had about nine inches of snow going into the weekend on the ground. It was cold. I mean, uh, Richmond, Virginia's high temperature the day of the snowstorm on Sunday set a record low for that for the for, for Richmond, right? So whatever is going to come down is going to come down in snow. And there was a heavy snow warning out for Sunday Sunday night um, into Monday, and it started snowing Sunday afternoon with single digit temperatures. And we got about three and a half inches into the evening and stopped. And the weather service took all the warnings down. So now, so we call that phase one mm -hmm. the storm, right? And um, and I was like bummed out. <laughs> and so, and then I um, uh, listened to the uh, eleven o'clock news. Um, Willard Scott was on NBC then. He did all the birthdays for the old people. So you couldn't get any updates, right? But it was not <laughs> snowing. The, the warnings were down, and I says, well, you know, uh, CBS, the football game is on. I'll listen to Gordon Barnes. So I stayed up to midnight, and Gordon Barnes comes on. He's all excited. And I noticed the barometer was falling. I always tap the barometer, right? Barometer's falling. And he says, hey, the storm's developing. The, snow, the snow's not over yet. But he didn't say how much we were going to get and all that. So, okay, so I went to bed. I woke up about 4 o'clock in the morning. And it was snowing so hard, I didn't have to put the backlights. You got backlights on, you, right? You got lights yeah. on in your backyard, right? Yeah, you put them on so you yeah. can see if it's snowing on. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. So I didn't even have to put the lights on. That's how hard it was snowing. Mm. Four to five inches an hour. Okay. Yeah. And then, Lance, what was your... Where were you? I was in... We were in Lexington, Massachusetts. I was on sabbatical. And in Lexington, we just got to watch the high clouds go by. You don't know how frustrating that is to watch the high clouds go by knowing that this guy is getting a big <laughs> snowstorm further to the, further to the south. Um, and the only reason I got involved in the, in, the, in the research on the President's Day storm probably was because I was on sabbatical. Mm. I, went to, I was in NCAR at NOAA in Boulder for the summer and, and then at MIT for the whole next academic year. Um, so I was able to drop everything when that, when that happened. But I mean, three things happened during that sabbatical that were life-altering experiences that re relate to the President's Day storm. The first thing was 
in Colorado, I mean, working with the Maisonette people, the small scale people like Chuck Doswell and uh, um, Ed Zipser and people like that, and Mike French, they're all talking about convective storm forecasting. Right. So I challenged everybody to put their money where their mouth was and probably create the thunderstorm forecast game in, in Boulder that summer. And we just forecast what 24 hour probability of, of thunderstorm in Denver at Stapleton, the old Stapleton Airport. And the very first day we did this was like 95 over 18. That's a typical summer day in Boulder where, you know, uh, if, if you pour water at, at this level, it evaporates before it gets to the ground kind of day um, in there. The lifting condensation level was halfway to Mars. And this little cell formed right over Boulder, went down the Denver Boulder Turnpike, right over Stapleton Airport, and Thunder verified. Everybody in the forecast had a zero. Total wipeout. And then so the next day was just, oh, but by forcing people to put a number down and a probability, the idea was to get probabilistic forecasting launched. And that's uh, what Ross now manages on the thunderstorm forecasting game. That's how the thunderstorm forecasting game originated. And then choosing the 10 cities um, from that. That was the first thing that happened. The second thing that happened was um, there had been the Johnstown flood of July of 1977. And that was a very unusual uh, uh, event. And I teamed up with Fred Sanders and we, and we wrote a paper about that while I was on sabbatical and showed the multiple stages of the life cycle of an MCS that originated in the lee of the Rockies over South Dakota, compacted and intensified at night, weakened and spread out during the day as it moved eastward, really illustrated the diurnal cycle. And some of Dick Johnson's work at Colorado State University really contributed to that in our understanding. And then I looked at the postscript and it produced a tropical storm unnamed over the coast, showing how these strongly vortical circulations could produce, spit up into a tropical-like disturbance that didn't have to originate from an Af African disturbance coming off the coast of, of Africa. And then the third thing was the, was the President's Day storm. Um, and how we did it. I guess you're going to ask about how we did the analysis. Yeah, eventually. so so what, I mean, all right, so you had the time to do the analysis. Right, and that's exactly you, it, at you, the time. You started that analysis, and I mean, what was, I mean, how did it progress? I mean, did it just seem like, well, this is an ordinary study of a rapidly developing cyclone, or you know, no. was there a surprising there result was, along the way? Or Well, there was, an interesting, there was an interesting structure aloft, and there was interesting structure in the boundary layer um, in there. And I got all the ship observations. What you did, we you know how you got the, you did mention it the other day. You sent off to the NAT, was then called the National Climatic Data Center. And it, it was about the thing, it was as slow as molasses, but three months later, big reams of paper products would come um, with the data. And the whole idea was to get all the ship observations because those were crucial for doing an offshore analysis. And many of those ship observations were not on the global telecommunication system but they had hard copies of it in Asheville. And the most valuable things were remarks about what was going on in there. And there's some remarks I remember to this day, um, somebody on a ship writing, moon dimly visible through a latrine window. So, okay, what were they doing? <laughs> you see, that would, these are all things that you would not see in a normal ob observation, but things like pressure jump or things like, um, peak gusts or some wind gusts like that, that sometimes didn't get into the actual observations um, in there. So I assembled all these things and plotted them all on, on weather maps. And you got the temperatures from that too, right? You got the temperatures right. from that. And so that's, I did the best possible surface analysis I could and the temperature analysis and, and sea level pressure analysis, and then said, I need to build a consistent three-dimensional st structure of the atmosphere at different, at different times. So what I did was I analyzed the temperature, um, got a temperature field, then basically got a thickness between 1,000 and 900 hectopascal, added the thickness value to the, sea, to the 1,000 millibar height field to get my 900 millibar height field, wash, rinse, and repeat, work my way upward in 100 millibar increments, all doing this manually, by the way, for multiple time periods. That's the kind of thing you can do on a sabbatical. And Fred Sanders was very interested in what was going on and, and said, that line should be over here, not over there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we'd argue about, uh, about the things. But I basically had a hydrostatically consistent three-dimensional analysis at multiple different times. 
and that was the basis for the computation. Okay, so and that that's, the, that's the Lance D var that is so well known then for yeah. the surface analysis. I don't recommend doing that today because it takes a year okay. um, to, to do that kind of thing. And Louis, did you know that he was working on this case or were you no. in contact? No, I, I, I don't remember the inter any interaction while he was spinning up on this. And it took me a while to get into the case study for several reasons. Again, being new at the Goddard Laboratory for Atmospheric Sciences, that was new itself. There, was, there wasn't really access to data. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, Bill Skillman uh, eventually set up a, uh, a synoptic lab, which became a go-to place, you know, as, it, as they do, uh, as they become in any organization. Um, but that wasn't, it wasn't, it was being set up, it wasn't quite set up. And uh, so I didn't have access to the data. I was the, one of the new people there in this new laboratory. Joanne Simpson wasn't there yet. We didn't get the, the new six slots that I eventually got to hire people like Dan Kaiser, Steve Koch, Vigal Chen, Ralph Peterson, Paul Kosen, you know, I mean, that wasn't, you know. But I was interested in the case and my, um, but I didn't come into work the next day. Well, we didn't come to work for the next three days. <laughs> um, to say, okay, I'm going to analyze this yeah. case, which is, you know, I was spinning up a modeling capability in this new lab. I was spinning up, um, uh, you know, the, the whole Vaz demonstration mm -hmm. thing was starting up. So, so that's where I was, but I was really interested in this case. Where I s started getting serious is when I heard his first presentation, and the way I heard it uh, was the emphasis on the low levels, you know, basically uber alles, right? Mm -hmm. And I said, no way. Right, no way, no way, right? So um, that's when I started saying, okay, I'm gonna get into this get case. And that, and that was it. about a year afterwards. Mm -hmm. And I, the way I got the data, and when I get into a case study, um, it was isentropic and isobaric with cross sections. So, you know, you got two different coordinate systems to work with. I was doing Eulerian, I was already, already doing um, so we do the regular analysis, but I was also doing the trajectory analysis uh, that you know Ralph Peterson and I came up with while I was at Wisconsin to do those trajectories. So I was doing Lagrangian views, and it it uh, so I had to get set up for that. Yeah. So you said the first time that you were really got into this was when you saw Lance's paper get yeah. published. Yeah. And and how did that make you feel? I mean, what were, what were your thoughts on that? Very competitive. <laughs> And he's, if he tells you he's not competitive, he grew up in New York too, right? So, um, yeah, I was very competitive because I was all into jet streaks. And the, the point was, as I, I was warned by John Young, at MIT, right? He's an MIT grad. He was a new professor at Wisconsin. And Dave Houghton, who I believe came out of the University of Washington, he said, you know, you, you're doing this great jet streak work, but when you get out of this department, you know, you're on your own, son. You know, there's not that much you know, love for, mm -hmm. uh, for jets, that kind of thing. It just moves stuff around, doesn't develop things, right? <laughs> so they said that. They did, yeah. they did. No, they were reflecting what the view was. Yeah. If you read Jerry Malman's papers back from those days and others, it was an effective thing. They didn't even talk about indirect circulations, right? I mean, it was like, my God. So I said, this is a subtropical jet here that's, that grew to 80 meters per second, blowing through a ridge, uh, which I already had that sense was dynamically unstable, as we showed in our papers. but. I said, how, you know, there's, I was I was reading only the low level stuff, and not that he said upper level stuff wasn't important, but the whole paper was just focused on the low level thing yeah. as, as sort of. The, and I says, well, we got some work to do here. So okay. that was my first, and of course I went in with a purely dynamic approach to this um, from a upper level jet, and then. The, the phase two was really the, the, the deepening trough and the trouble mm -hmm. was It was all dynamics until we started doing the models. So, so the first two papers were kind of observational explorations right. of the two phases of the storm, right. right? And that was your argument with Lance on the on uh, I the would say upper was, levels versus. I, I I've never argued with Lance. I've debated Lance. Okay. Uh, I want to. I argued with with Jackham, John Jackham, but I never argued with Lance. I debated. Him. And, and um, that was on the QE2 storm thing. So, but the point was, I was clearly coming into the papers mm -hmm. with the idea of what was going on a lot. Mm -hmm. 
And, and what, did you do conference presentations or whatever? Yes. Lance, did you yes. see these? And the, oh, and, yeah. And the Cyclone the, Workshops. The yeah. Cyclone Workshop came out of the great, the great debates. And the yeah. first one was at NSEP. And we learned we were never going to do it again at NSEP <laughs> because the NSEP guys, I mean, it was then NMC, they came in, gave their talks and left. Said, except Norm Phillips. Except Norm Phillips. Yeah. And, yeah. and then everybody said, we're not going to do that. We're going to go in the middle of nowhere, which is why we picked Val Marin in yeah. Quebec. So can I do a, a sort of a level set here for the students? The models we had for 1979 was the LFM, up to 48 hours, seven level model. If it had a boundary layer, yeah. <laughs> didn't use even the significant level data from right. the sound. That was the problem. Okay, so how the hell is it going to capture a tropopause fold, for example, right? You don't have the significant level data. Yeah. The PE was the same thing. It was a hemispheric, it was in global. We didn't run global models operationally until 1985, okay? So, so you're dealing with seven level model, seven level model. Physics, very crude if they have whatever physics they know is tied in with the uh, precip. And in fact, they use the fudge factor for the precip in the LFM, famous multiply by two at the end. Or right? four thirds, or, or first third. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> so so um, that's what we're dealing with with models. Mm -hmm. right? So I just want to level set that. that yeah. So NMC would come in mm -hmm. and uh, they were sitting there saying, well, you know, okay, we got to improve our models and all that. But you know, Norm Phillips' comment, we were giving them mesoscale reasons why they would have to really start accelerating the development of this. And Norm uh, was asking, was pushing back because he loved to push back on, on things, you know, to draw you out. But um, when Mel was doing the uh, upper level furnogenesis part, uh, I remember Norm saying, well, you know, raise that. You know, we, we produce cyclones with two-level models. You know, why, why, why do I, why do I, shoot, why should I care about this? I, yeah. Mel, Mel froze. You know, he kind of, kind of didn't answer. Yeah, well, Norm was a, was a, as a teacher was doing, always asking those yeah, kind of yeah, questions to yeah. drive us nuts. So I got think. up and said, yeah. "Well, maybe it's because you know, uh, your two-level models produce a cyclone, but it takes sixty hours to do it. And what we see here is it develops in twelve hours." And it's probably related to the higher resolution, not only horizontally, but vertically. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Norm said that I sat down, I forget who I was sitting next to, he said, you know, you just took on Norm Phillips. I says, well, you know, he asked, he asked the question. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah. So, but anyway, um, Norm was, uh, when I went to, uh, in and out of NMC before I actually joined up in 1989, he was a, he was a mentor to me. Mm. He was, he came back, you know, he give me advice and stuff like that. So, um, and he was also a reviewer on paper three. Mm -hmm. it took two and a half years to get it through the review process. So, um, you know, that was the kind of, but that was the kind of environment we were in with this particular storm, which actually, as we saw with the mesoscale models, you needed the mesoscale to simulate this storm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. And then Lance, what was your response? I mean, we're, obviously you're having these debates at the Cyclone Workshop, but at some point they must have submitted a paper. Were you the reviewer on it or? How, no, I didn't. I let's see. I think I was asked to, to referee. There's one. I'm trying to remember which one of your papers. Paper I wasn't three. the original reviewer. Paper, I bet you it was paper three. Okay. Well, yeah, I wasn't one of the original reviewers. Yeah. The the editor came to me and said, "I know that you know you you intimately know this storm and stuff like that, and we have a deadlock, and I I need somebody who's familiar with the storm to to comment." <laughs> and I ha I didn't have any issues with. So yeah. so um, on paper <laughs> three which was the synergistic paper, which really got me into, yeah, I went, Lads is right, you need that boundary layer. You know, we, we agreed at some point that we met, what, at the 700 millimeter yeah, level? Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the thing is, um, that paper went in, it had, um, it really, it was like paper one was the subtropical jet going into ridge, phase one of the precip. Paper two was the tropopause fault, and Dan, you're gonna have to make some comments on that before you leave, because he was a co-author on that paper. So the tropopause fold happening prior to cyclogenesis, because at the time tropopause folds were written by like Toby Carlson and others that happened simultaneously with cyclogenesis. This thing happened upstream, came in over. Um, and then paper three then was a mesoscale model doing phase one with the subtropical jet and all that. And, um, and, then, uh, and then we did the, uh, in that same paper, with and without the latent heating, boundary layer heating, and then, and it turns out the bottom line with that was you needed everything. You needed the boundary layer and latent heating with the dynamics, 
right? And that's when I said, and I had to use, okay, so what happened was with the paper goes in and it got creamed, right? You mean rejected or? It wasn't quite rejected, but it was creamed. I mean, it it was basically, I found out that Norm was one of the reviewers and what that what we did, and it was a, it was with relationship to what the boundary layer uh-huh. that we were using. So um, so I know uh, Ticello was one of the he wanted to say, oh we got to drop this you know we got to drop this no I ain't gonna drop this so so we went in I swear to God I wrote a twenty seven page single space response <laughs> to the reviewers which is the journal article in itself yes <laughs> and and um, but we also reran the entire experiment. And we took Lance's paper and created simulated soundings over the ocean because we knew the detail of what he did in the boundary layer. We used those soundings as part of the data field for the data assimilation into the models. And with those soundings, we got a more realistic prediction. And that's, and so, so that's why it took two and a half years. We reran everything. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, based on that review. But when I sent that back in, <laughs> that's when I wrote the 27 page. <laughs> of resp- I thought, well, this will get them. So 27 pages, single space um, re- response. I got that somewhere in a box uh, at home. But it, and then, and then, a, uh, and then I had a discussion with Norm, and that's, it got in. I okay. didn't know, I, that's got to be the one, though, that, that they had, because I know the referee, uh, the editor was, was, um, what do I do with this now, right? So, so anyway, it okay. got published. It got published. That's right. the main thing. So. Well, you mentioned Dan Kaiser, and, and Dan Kaiser was under working under you at NASA. Right. Let's bring – Dan happens to be okay. in the audience. He's a professor at and State that, University of New York at Albany now. He worked with me at NASA. Nobody worked under me All because right. <laughs> I always felt that the people that I hired were smarter than me, actually. Um, so uh, I was blessed by having – those folks uh, working, uh, working there, and did amazing things. So, should I explain paper two just to teach? Yeah, that would yeah. be good. Yeah. Yeah. So, paper two had to do with the uh, tropopause folding and the, the 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 trough that was actually not that badly forecast. The, the trough itself wasn't that badly forecast by the LFM, but it certainly didn't get the trop- this tropopause fold that we had diagnosed went all the way down to like 850 millibars. It was really remarkable. Well, the hypothesis was, was that there were mesoscale processes over the central U.S. tied in with this upper-level furnogenesis that Dan was, did a lot of work on. And I'll let him take it from... And at that pre tropos fold, in tropos fold, we were able to track with the TOMP, the total ozone mapping sensor from one of the satellites and, and, and the analysis in between and trajectories. Mm. We, got, we did all that. But could we show that that circulation regime was associated with these upper-level frontogenesis. And Dan, I, I still remember you coming in, I, we, we had this discussion, and you know, he just was like, do you understand? Go, go ahead. I'm doing just fine. Anyway, um, I know this isn't what you asked, and I know time's limited, but I just want to let everyone here know, and your future audiences, that everything I've been hearing is, I lived this. I lived and witnessed this history occurring, and everything you're hearing is absolutely true. I swear it is. And also, uh, it's amazing. Almost 40 years later, to make it feel like it's today, um, it's just it's an incredible experience to be hearing it again and, and reliving it. But as far as the uh, what the big question was is that could um, there was clearly uh, there was a mesoscale precursor or precursor uh, features. Uh, that, that were, could be resolved in advance of the President's Day Storm uh, development. And the question was, were they important? In other words, the idea was forecasters knew this before the research community was. I, I heard this when I was a uh, you know, high school, you know, junior high school gu- uh, guy at Franklin Institute Weather Center. Uh, the forecaster there said, always look for the jet streaks, and they'll, you'll find them in advance of major East Coast snowstorms. If you don't see it, don't forecast it. So I, this just made total sense to me, and I got support for this at Penn State from uh, John Kerr, a synoptic meteorology professor. And then here we are, a President's Day storm, and Louis saying the same thing. So I said, it's there, it's got to be important, and how can we really show it? And the best tool I knew about was a very simple uh, 
a, very, a highly simplified equation called the sawyer eliasson equation, which allowed one to diagnose transverse circulations in, in frontal zone, surface and upper level. The problem was this equation applies best in idealized theoretical circumstances, not in a real world situation. So I'm very, I'm, I'm cautious and risk averse in the idea of <laughs> applying this equation in, with data sets that were, uh, these were objective, objectively analyzed radio sign data, they were they, data sets. They weren't numerical models, they weren't dynamically consistent. We had to be able to infer ageostrophic winds, uh, vertical motion, geostrophic winds, all these kinds of things that uh, were notorious, notoriously difficult to do with real data. But the wonderful thing about Louis, he more than balanced my risk-averse personality and said, go for it, go do it, go, go you know, run the, do the diagnostics. And we got a beautiful signature. It was what one would expect. There was, uh, uh, it actually wasn't so much an indirect circulation, but it was a downward motion focused, uh, a, a mesoscale region of substance downward motion right underneath the jet streak where the tropopause fold was forming. So basically I got, you're done. You don't, we're gonna publish this. And meanwhile, it's my problem to figure out how to justify it. <laughs> but there's a section in President's Day, uh, in the President's Day storm, uh, was it part two, yeah, 1985. Two. Yeah. I, I read it a couple days ago to prepare and I wouldn't change a thing. Yeah. I said it exactly and you know, again, so what we had, went through all the limitations and all the restrictions, yet there was a signature here in advance of a cyclone and it was very, very convincing that this idea that tropopause folds would occur in conjunction with cyclogenesis wasn't the full story. And I think this was a, a sense that this was, I think, what's new and, and still is, when I look back at what was the advance, that was, that was it. Yeah. And, yes. oh, yeah. and I should say one more, one other thing too, is that work, in my mind, actually led to, uh, I think, a great advance. I don't think it gets enough attention and started right here, actually, in our department which is the idea that uh, tropopause folds are a manifestation of tropopause-based vortical features, or vortices, they're mesoscale. They typically originate in the Arctic. They're, uh, we call them coherent tropopause disturbances. Uh, Stephen Cavallo, University of Washington, is a graduate student now at the University of Oklahoma, renamed them as tropospheric polar vortices. And they're the, uh, they're the features that uh, basically are, we, I think even, uh, Kevin, I think Kevin Beardak, I think for a class project, I don't know, Kevin may have, he's here, may have actually checked to see if there was a, uh, if the precursor to the President's Day storm, uh, cyclogenesis was a tropospheric polar vortex. Anyway, this research went places and uh, I think is, uh, it has a very, it's very well, I think very much ahead of its time. So, so my compliments to you for pushing me as, and, and, as hard as you could. Oh yeah, uh, we went through a couple of meetings and uh, <laughs> discussions. Because, and if you read that section, I think about two thirds of it is why, you know, all the, all the uh, assumptions and, yeah. you know, why, it's almost like if you read them, why is it, why this is crazy, where you were attempting this, but then you get to the bottom of it and it says, and the signal worked. <laughs> and, and the thing is, uh, the other aspect of this, you know, we've talked about the state of knowledge. There's a, there was a group at Goddard Space Flight Center um, that was high, high atmospheric physics. Uh, Mark Schobel was there, um, uh, since became famous in these uh, uh, tropopause tropo type of things. There was a belief that there was very little interaction between the stratosphere and the uh, troposphere. So even to use the TOMS data to track, to, be, you, to, to start tracking this thing, and that you would get this, the TOMS data was the one that, that discovered the, uh, the, the uh, 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 Tom, total ozone yeah. mapping uh, spectrometer, uh, spectrometer right? is the one that did the ozone hole over, over the Antarctic, okay? Oh, you're yeah, great for that. So our, it was Kruger, Arlen Kruger, Kruger. Yeah. yeah. You know, he came up to me, he says, you know, this data, so I don't, you know, you're talking about ozone, you know, and I said, well, let me take a look. And I looked at my eyes fell out of my head. The upper atmosphere guys and gals didn't believe that this could happen, right? Uh, Danielson had, you know, was up against this when he was defining yeah. the stratospheric extrusions. Yeah, yeah. Right. And, and yet, and I thought they would just accept this, but they didn't. The only proposal I had rejected in my entire life is I wrote to the upper atmospheric group to do more studies on these types of things, and it got rejected. And they said, "This doesn't happen." Literally, you know, and this was NASA. This was out of NASA headquarters. So this was a big deal. Uh, first of all, the stratospheric extrusion, the tropopause fold occurring prior 
to cyclogenesis and then a subsequent development, and you could track with the ageostrophic, the ageostrophic nature of the, of the trajectories, you could track that air. The timing was perfect. Um, so, you know, I, I felt pretty confident. And I didn't know that the Sawyer Eliasson application would work as well as it did, but I, we had a circulation with the sinking air out of the objective analysis, and we put both of those figures right next to each other on the same page in, the, in an article to say, hey, we've got two different, two different approaches to this, giving sinking air on the warm side uh, right, in the, right in the jet. And, to yeah. Interrupt the two, and maybe if it's OK. No, go uh, ahead. Yeah, go ahead. One of the, uh, another perception was uh, when I was involved in this work, and it might have been a, a, a Norm Phillips conversation, because at Cyclone Workshops, I either like to sit next to Norm Phillips and listen to the color commentary, it was, it was fantastic, or Fred Sanders. It was, he, I learned a lot, humorous or whatever, and they, they, they were terrific. And I remember uh, talking, so Norm was, you could call him Norm, it didn't have to be Dr. Phillips. And I remember talking to him about my, how excited I was about the tropopause folds and all this sort of thing. And I said, uh, and I also knew the story about the two-layer model. So I asked him about it, and he said, uh, with all due respect, he said, uh, and you're young enough, maybe we, you know, you'll you listen to me. He said, this is embroidery. It's not, it's, he said, uh, it, it, you know, and I asked, what about gravity waves and all the things Louis taught me? He said, it's embroidery. He said, it's not the whole picture, and it's not really very important. And he, he really meant it. And I said, uh, can I argue with you? And sure, because he, he liked, I guess he was a professor at heart. He liked that. He was the brilliant. Was you could, yeah, yeah. You could, he would listen, and you could do that. And I think that what we've come to see is the embroidery turns out to be, when it comes down to weather forecasting, it does matter where, where uh, snow bands set up. It does, the track of, uh, and uh, the timing of the intensification of a storm, all these things matter to a forecast. Yeah, you know, maybe conceptually and maybe from a, uh, from a, when you back off, if you want to understand the sim in the simplest way, how does a cyclone work, maybe you don't need these features. You can do it more simply, but for weather forecasting, these features are absolutely essential. And I, I hope I'm saying it right. Yeah. This was the, the argument that when I came to see that one, I guess one person's embroidery is somebody else's, uh, I don't know, we can try to complete the picture there or the, or the, the term, but that's how it was viewed so, at the time. So what I used when I did the Palmain paper, yeah. the review paper, which was, you know, based on all these discussions and, and discussions with Lance and everything, you know, it's a spectrum of mass momentum adjustments from, you know, the gravity wave scale up to the, up to the larger scale. It's, it's, it's a spectrum. And you actually see, like, the, the, uh, the Rush Snyder paper that was in weather and forecasting, gravity wave passing through the center of a low in the Midwest during the rapid developing phase and then separating and going, it's a, hitting the gravity wave and the low both passed over Chicago. Is that where it shuts the snow down for? That was the, yeah. That was the big yeah. Chicago snow. Yeah. 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 So, so, yeah. so the, the Chicago's lowest pressure was when the gravity wave passed through. And, the, and then you can see where the center of the low pass through. It, it goes down, but it doesn't go down as much. So what's rapid cyclogenesis? I can tell you that for the 2016 storm off the coast that Paul Benny didn't get any. Sorry, Lance. That's, it's still <laughs> well, you're always doing this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That a gravity wave passed through the center of the storm at 75 mile an hour winds during its rapid development phase off the coast of the Del Marva Peninsula. So what's rapid cyclogenesis? I mean, these are the kinds of things we were talking about you know, in, in at Goddard's, at Goddard's Visual Center. One thing while you're still here, the paper that he wrote, that I was the second author on, and I, he asked me to be part of it, I was really proud to be part of this paper, was when we wrote the paper about the use of model output for synoptic and mesoscale analysis purposes to basically rejuvenate synoptic meteorology. Because I can tell you, I had professors tell me, stop the synoptic stuff, synoptic is dead. I know you were hearing similar things. Um, and we were just, we wrote this paper in 1987 in the bulletin. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. this is a rebirth, as far as I was concerned, uh, that what we were gaining out of this synoptic, uh, I mean, out of the model analysis of these, of the President's Day storm, we were referencing papers from Newton and Palmain and others how they visualize this stuff with hand analysis was beyond me, but they were actually describing a process we were seeing in the models. We were diagnosing from the models. It was just stunning. And we needed 15-minute output to understand the low-level jet you yeah. know, over your coastal front. Yeah. It took 15-minute data to understand how that thing got you know, generated in three hours. Okay? 
you couldn't do that back in, in the 80s if you were going to rely just on op, you know, observational database. You needed it. Yeah. You needed this. And that's the paper that, that Dan put together and he invited me to be part of. And I, I thank you for doing that, by the way. So, yeah. so the synthesis then kind of comes to the, to the 1987 paper, what, what the synergistic interactions between an upper level jet stream and diabetic processes. Yeah. And notably, the, the President's Day storm is not in the title of this article. Was that intentional? You know, you pointed that out to me and I went back and looked and I said, well, you know what? The, the title was getting too long. And <laughs> the, first of all, the paper was too long. I should have broken it up into two papers. The title was getting too long, but you're right. There was, there was, mm. there was just, there was no reason why all the, the other questions. When the paper came yeah, out. yeah, but, but oh, I and the other thing is, I wanted to focus on synergistic. Yeah, right. I, I wanted that, and and uh, that was the other thing Norm challenged me on. You know, prove to me that this is synergy. You know, synergy is you got one plus one and you get three, right? I mean that kind of thing. So you get certain development with boundary layer. You actually get more development with boundary layer and, and, and no latent heating than you get with latent heating and no boundary layer. Well, just to back up there, what, what you did was run a mesoscale model, model right? And then took out all the, all the thermodynamics. Basically. Right, so you ran the, the dry control right. run, dry adiabatic control run. And I, I was betting everybody on the floor, man, we're going to nail it with the adiabatic run. And I was wrong. So that didn't work. So then we put the we put the boundary layer in. Well, then we ran everything. We got it. Got the control we, run. We, yeah, everything we did the control it, yeah. run. And we got it. So okay, let's take everything out. I bet you we still get it. Didn't get it, right? So then we put the boundary layer in, and we got a pretty good signal, but, but no latent heating. Then we put the latent heating in without the boundary. It got a really weak signal. Then we put put those both back in and then re re yep. did it. So uh, the synergy then was you really got the spin up. Uh, by having all these work. And that was really then became the basis of the Palmain uh, paper that yeah. we wrote. You know. But I thought what was important, you know, looking back on that paper now is is just what you said. It, it it basically set the stage for model, you know, modern model sensitivity studies in synoptic meteorology. And now yeah. what you're saying is that and, you know, diag and diagnostics. Yeah, and diagnostics. Right. Right. And, and that was a critical this, thing. And the diagnostics. And the diagnostics. Yeah. 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 And then that fed into the 1987 bulletin article on the value of oh. mesoscale modeling to right. rejuvenate synoptic meteorology. And I remember Rick Anthes uh, contacting us and saying this is, this is going to be a really important article for you know, uh, doing future studies when we did that with the mesoscale models. So. Cool. Yep. Thanks. OK, so we've, we've got the, the modernization of synoptic meteorology, the, the, the model sensitivity studies, the, the diagnostics. Looking back now on, on this episode, it's, what are you most proud of that, that you can reflect on, Lance? How the cyclone workshops got created, uh, and particularly the port deposit. Uh, was that 84 or 85? I think it was, it was in April, 80. and it was 90 degrees all week, when and did, there was no air conditioning. When did QE2 have? It was after QE2. Yeah, it was after QE2. Yeah. Um, that was quite a meeting. I mean, that was contentious from the opening talk to the end of the meeting, uh, but it was extremely intellectually stimulating yeah. uh, meeting. So that was, Dick Reed went crazy on me uh, at that meeting, that's why I remember it, because I was taking on Jackham's uh, work, you know, because he, Jackham <laughs> and Rick Anthes were specifically saying that there was no upper level forcing. So I went and got the soundings for us, the East Coast, you know, I said, it was, the, it was, it was a tropopause fold upstream of that that was, more impressive than the one for the president states always said, wait a minute folks, you got a problem here. So yeah, that was that was pretty remarkable. Thing I, the thing I was the most proud of with respect to this is we brought we put everything on the table. You know, like I said, isentropic, isobaric, Eulerian, Lagrangian, um, got a hold of Bill Hibbert, um, who was having um, problems getting his software accepted at the University of Wisconsin because it wasn't in the uh, uh, Makaitis format. He was one of the first people out there to use Unix. We were the first people to use Unix when I brought Mary. Oh, I forgot Mary Dejardin. Oh my God, you know she developed the Gempack system, which I know people still use at universities. She was part of our group. She, she, she passed away just recently, by the way. And, but she used to tell people, Louis Uccellini goes around and says, he, he picked me to come on over. I want you to know, I picked him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So if anybody knows Mary, that's Mary Dejardin. 
So um, we brought everything to the table on this. Well, it's very clear. I mean, looking back now, I mean, I've, I haven't read these papers in years, and, and you know, the, everything is just so thorough and, and calculated. I mean, even more so than many of the papers we see now. You just picked apart every part of that storm in these, you know, five papers that went through. And when you throw in, you know, the, the two papers that Lance wrote, you know, I mean, the diagnostics with the kinetic energy and, and that. I mean, it's just such a thorough piece of work. It must be the, the most well-studied storm. I and mean, certainly at that time, I mean, maybe it's superseded by the superstorm of 93, but- Yeah, but it's what it did, how it transformed. That yeah. storm basically changed the whole way science was done. Um, that was not the intention. It was trying to figure out what was going on. This was all. This was collateral damage in a great set, in a positive way. Yeah. <laughs> so, so one of the other aspects of it, you know, we talk about pride and all that. One of the things that was also happening by the time we got to the fourth paper, the Whitaker at L. Jeff Whitaker. Um, some other things were happening at Goddard. There were students who were signing up for summer programs and coming to us to spend a summer with us. You know, as part of this, much like I went to NCAR in the summer of, of uh, 74, which, you know, changed my life, right? Um, like I said, when I got in as a junior, I honestly didn't have the full breadth of the dynamic, the, the physical, um, dynamical basis, uh, mathematical basis of meteorology. And here I am, you know, now two years later building models and doing these kind of studies. So it's just stunning. But 74, I had this. So Greg Hakem was one of our summer students, and he worked on a project with me, and I made, I told Greg, I said, you work with me, you're gonna write a paper, right? I don't care if it's eight weeks, you got, you go back to, go back to Albany, we worked on it. His first publication was the paper doing it, so was Jeff Whitaker's. Mm -hmm. So Jeff came in, and, um, and we were doing now the second phase with the model diagnostics, and we were doing all these back trajectories, like, where did this air come from? Dick Reed was going nuts over people who were talking about, um, what do we call them, the conveyor belts. Remember the conveyor yeah. belt thing? Peter Hobbs, yeah. Peter yeah. Hobbs was doing the conveyor yeah. belt. Dick Reed was going nuts at, at these, uh, on jet streaks and conveyor I was glad the conveyor belt came along because it took the heat off of me for a while. So, <laughs> so we did these back trajectories. We, we put a square on, and we're doing mass divergence. We're mm -hmm. doing all the mass divergence cut calculations following this, almost like quasi-Lagrangian. And then the back, and damn, if it wasn't conveyor belts coming in, you know, that they, they would converge in mm. and then, and I actually- We didn't call them atmospheric rivers then, but-, but No, no, I know, yeah. well, yeah. that's another story. Yeah. But the thing is, uh, we did this, and I asked, and I could tell Jeff Whitaker was like, you know, he was, we were getting, it, Michael Morgan came in, Reader from Australia came. I mean, we, it was like, wow, you know, these folks are really thinking this is neat stuff, right? So I asked Jeff, I said, I, okay, you're going to go to Florida State for your PhD. You want to, do you want to write this up? You know, I, I was outlining it with them. We would do all the figures and all that stuff. So you, you write this up, you can be the lead author. He says, okay. I says, but, you know, none of this, I'll get back to you next year. You know, we, we iterate over a monthly basis. So he came through, that's the lead author. I think, that is probably, you know, that, that really, except for the visualization that we put published in the bulletin, that, you know, we were finding stuff, like I said, um, that, again, people like Newton and, and Palme were writing about. I'll tell you something that, uh, um, in the paper three, with that low-level jet, mm -hmm. um, you know, I was, my PhD thesis on coupling low-level jets up all the jet was really horizontal, you know, everything was done horizontally, changing pressure gradient force horizontally, vertical mass adjustments, but looking at it purely from what was happening on a on an isentropic surface. So we always talked about what would happen if parcels, you know, would cut through. You did have diabetic process. So when we did the uh, the diagnostics on the initial stage where we got this 30 meter per second low level jet developing in, in within three hours, it was when the parcels would come along and bump, you know, they'd be in sort of gradient balance or, or you know, near geostrophic balance or not that far off. But when they hit the coastal front and the latent heat that was going on there, they'd wind up where there was an open wave. So now the parcel is perpendicular 
to the pressure gradient, right? The 700 millibar wave is like this, the parcel comes up, and now it's perpendicular. And that's when the acceleration kicked in. Three hours, boom, you got a 30 meters per second wind max over here. And if you got 30 meters per second along the East Coast, you're gonna get heavy snow, okay? You know, you- Guaranteed. So, guaranteed. So, so I, call up, I call up Don Johnson, my major professor, and I say that it's, uh, it's raining up. Yeah. Do you protect this? Um, I don't know what's going on. They're probably they're doing the roof or something. The, um, so I, I go, Don. And I explained everything to him on the phone. He's picturing it. I said, we've just, we've just describing the three-dimensionality of this adjustment process for the low-level jet for the first time. And he goes, uh, you ought to go back and read this paper by Newton in 1950, that he wrote in 1953. He described exactly what I told Don on the phone, based on his analysis mm. and what must have been going on on the field. It was written so well, I, I quoted Newton to describe the process. And I felt a little down, and Don told me on the phone, I called him up, I said, you know, I've, you, know you, you, you ruined my day here, Don, you know, you know that, right? <laughs> so he said, he said, look, there was always this, uh, this joy in rediscovering something yeah. as much as there is in discovering something. Right? But you put it in a different context. And, and it's, it, yeah. it's, a, it's a learning process, you know? And he was absolutely right, of course. And, uh, but I, uh, you know, I was so amazed by the insights that these synopticians had after World War II, even prior to World War II, you know, that they were, they were starting to work with upper level data in Europe and here in the United States before the war. The insights that these folks had, Pedersen, it's, it's absolutely stunning, actually. Because they lived the data. They lived the data. It took you, it took us, two, it took me, two, like the gravity ratio, two years to just get the data to the point where I was analyzing it. Yeah. Think about that, right? Rich Grum wrote up the President's Day, the two storm in, yeah. in 2000. Remember, he had the, the summary? Yeah, the yeah. summary. He had the summary in two I weeks. I can't say why I should publish he, it. He had it in two weeks. He had the summary of the whole storm. Because he could get all the data. He got all the data, yeah. you know? Jesus. So anyway. Yeah. Um, but that Whitaker yeah. at all. I could see paper. it. I knew, I knew what this yeah. thing looked like before I even started outlining the paper. I could visualize mm. what the figures would look like. Yeah. And those papers, the, the Whitaker et al. 88 paper, was so influential to my master's thesis because I was trying to understand um, the, the structure of an occluding cyclone from MM4 model data using trajectories, using these diagnostics that were in the, the software package that came with that, that was called Sigma. And I just didn't have any context. And so when I saw the Whitaker et al. paper, the things that I was seeing made sense. It confirmed what I was doing, and it helped explain some of these things that were consistent with the conveyor belt um, models, but then were also inconsistent with the conveyor right, belt model. Right. And it, said, it, right. you know, well, it's not the total picture. I mean, it's a good first cut, right. but you know, so that um, you know wraps it up. And then you know, you did you know with Hibbert the the Viz five D you know, movies of the, of the trajectories and everything. And that, I remember, I can't remember what conference I was at, saw that you were presenting, someone was presenting, maybe it was you, just blew me away because yeah. I thought that's what, that's where we need to go as a, as a community. We need this four dimensional, you know, the three dimensional structure and then also the time to see how all these things come together. So the, the when we were here, when we did the review of the President's Day storms the last time, I showed, I actually showed that, that visual, the, uh, the, the film that we did. In my 601 class, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And what's really neat when you watch this is that we, the trajectories with the tropopause fold are all moving with the, the white tornado, the, the two surface, right, of the... The depression, the, the right, tropopause. Uh, the tropopause comes down, looks like a tornado, um, and the, it's just moving right with it. The trajectories that start in the low levels, there, there is that secondary, like the house. You know, by the way, McIntyre spent the whole day before they wrote their paper about the double thing, and I didn't get an acknowledgement. I mean, I'm talking about like a year before they even started writing the article. Um, they, uh, but the parcels in the low levels went right through it, and I, you know, I'm looking at that. First of all, there's this this slant, so it's baroclinic, but then the parcels, that's your diabetic processes. 
Mm. So those parcels were passing through that low-level max that was growing up, and then the low level, and they actually almost merge and then turn vertical mm -hmm. right over the during the occlusion phase. Mm -hmm. It was really remarkable. I actually we went back and rewrote parts of the Whitaker uh, et al. paper before we submitted for publication after we saw, you know, what you could do with these uh, these visualizations. Okay. Uh, one of the things that hasn't been mentioned so far is that the solutions, the modeling that Louis did and others help to set the stage for the field programs to come because yeah. it pointed what kind of measurements we needed and where we needed to take mm. the measurements at different stages of, of, of the cycle and life cycle. And it took seven years <laughs> from February 1979 to Gale in right. January um, 1986 in Raleigh at the Weather Service Forecast Office. And that, that field experiment was really something else. <laughs> so. In that, I, I, I went to, because of this, I was arguing for three hourly data that we needed it upstream. And NSF wouldn't support it. And um, they all said, well, you're from NASA. You want it, you go get it, basically. And, you know, trying to get radius on data out of a space agency. Well, <laughs> Jim Dodge, who was the program manager at headquarters, after about the fourth meeting we had where I kept on arguing for the same thing, pulled me aside and said, you got it. And the three hourly data, we, we did a, a number of analysis. We, pe we published in the, uh, the uh, map, the uh, Meteorological and Atmospheric Physics Journal in Europe, because they do beautiful figures. You know? So I said, man, we, we want those figures. Um, we published those papers there for the most part. I was also kind of getting kind of annoyed at, uh, I think, at Fred, <laughs> you know, as the editor. So uh, I said, you know, I got to find enough. Yeah, because I, I couldn't spend two and a half years rewriting papers. So, so we went to that one. But the three hourly data is what woke me up to how lucky we were capturing some of the initial jet streak stuff because the jet streak circulation patterns evolved too mm -hmm. on mesoscale time scales. Yeah. And a jet does not go around the base of a trough. We've discovered that, you know, rediscovered that. Yeah. Um, it, yeah. it dies on the right side, new one forms. All this stuff was coming out because we had the three hourly data, you know, mm -hmm. out ahead of these. But NASA came through, and, uh, and, and Dodge also, Jim Dodge, uh, who had a contentious uh, relationship with uh, some of the people in the laboratory, um, you know, because they wouldn't acknowledge you know, his support. I made sure that I acknowledged his support. I mean, he was terrific mm -hmm. for what we were doing. He, he backed us up. So. I had problems getting my paper where I said that the jet streak doesn't go around the base of the trough. Mel was the reviewer of that paper, and because it contradicted his <laughs> schematic, he really put, he really made it difficult for yeah. me to get, yeah. get my paper published. But yeah, I mean, I, that's consistent with, right. with what you're saying. So, so looking back, I mean, obviously we've had a lot of success with that, it transformed the field. Was there anything that you would do differently now, the way, either the way the interactions happened or the way the science developed? Well, considering how accidental everything was in many ways, um, I mean, the atmosphere has been telling us for years things that happen. Most of the time, we're not paying attention. So the real, real lesson, especially to young people, is pay attention. I mean, I'm, I look at the weather maps every day. I uh, try to, and um, there's always something going on somewhere um, around the globe. Now we can look everywhere, all around the world, and there's always something going on. And, and you should like jot it down, note it, and. Um, they can eventually, years later, be elevated to research opportunities. So I, I think that we lived in a sort of a golden age, actually. Um, we had the fax room. You had to hand plot. You had to, if you were in the fax room, by the way, um, you weren't just an accidental tourist, right? <laughs> you got involved with what was going on. Um, all my papers, uh, back in the 70s and even into the President's Day storm started with data, uh, operational data. Yeah. It started with operational data. And um, by plotting it, by knowing even what to order from uh, NCDC, and it took six months, it took us six months to get the data. Um, you, you know, you just were working and reworking this operational data that you, we collected in the fax room uh, to, uh, so um, you could really live the storms. You could live the, mm -hmm. you know, you, and, and then what was really exciting was, you know, we started, I started applying, like when I did my uh, PhD work that I was learning, I couldn't believe how fast the stuff was coming to me. I was 
lucky, I think, in certain ways. Um, but um, I think what I would change today is go back. You know, I know, you know, people look at their phones, you know, they, they download some stuff, you know, oh, it's going to snow, you know, no, you know, you, 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 you got to go in there and, and start analyzing and figuring out in the model. Why no. is it going to snow? Why is it going to snow? And then understand um, now the models are capable of actually simulating gravity waves. And I think actually predicting gravity waves because, you know, uh, Anton, he had, we were in the gravity wave underground club. We, we haven't come out yet, right? So, <laughs> so we have the subterranean, the, literally. Yeah, we're in the <laughs> subterranean part. But he says, hey, you know, you really ought to watch this case. And sure enough, that's how I knew. That's why I was ready watch, watching for the gravity waves in the January 2016 case, right? So, so the thing is, it's in there. And, um, it's, and, and the models can help you diagnose, not just predict. And um, I'd like to see more of that. Um, I also wish, uh, this is going to be my gift to, uh, to you, David. Wow. You know, these five reprints. Do you know how You still have original reprints yes, from the big, journal. Yes, yes. Wow. So, because, it, and, you know, my wife wants me to throw everything away. Oh, all right. <laughs> all right. Don't, 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 don't let her know that I still hold these things. Okay. <laughs> so, so the thing is, so the thing is, these, getting these in the mail or getting these at the conferences, you know, um, you, you're not distracted. Uh, when you pick one of these things up, you're going to read these things, right? So, so this was important during during this whole dynamic we just discussed. I got his reprint. He made sure I, yeah. I had no excuses mm. for not reading his stuff, right? Um, and and that's that's the uh, that was the beauty of it all. And um, so, it's not the same these days, right? I mean, you want to let a colleague know, hey, I just wrote this paper. You may be interested in it. You send them an email, but it it lacks well, that. Personal. Because they've got a hundred other emails in a three-hour <laughs> period or something like well, that. Well, here's the thing. So everything is speeded up. There's a hell of a lot more knowledge floating around now that kids have to learn. Sorry, I'm calling you kids. Young adults have to learn. I'm so old now. You're all, you're all kids. So uh, you're younger than my kids. So, so the thing is, the thing is, um, I, I kind of sympathize. No, I'm more than sympathize. I understand. No, look, Lou, we can't spend two and a half years working on this. We've got to have something done now. Oh, by the way, we've got to have three things done now. I watch what the undergraduates bring to the conferences. It's stunning. It's stunning. You know, the it level really, has really, really been stunning. raised. Yeah. But there's something, you know, there's something missing in terms of not following through and getting to this point. Now, I know the students here, if you're graduate students here, and you're working with the professors here, chances are you're going to be publishing, right? Um, and that's good, because you're going to learn. You're going to learn by just doing that. And, um, but when I have discussions with folks coming in, especially in the forecast mode, and we, we're hiring really bright people, you know, coming out of places like this where you have the C-Star you know, grants and you're working with the forecasters and have a tremendous amount of experience. Um, there's still this detail. If it takes a lot of work to get to this point, I don't see, you know, it's like the gravity wave discussions that, hap that occasionally happen on the map. I'm ready to, you, you say, well, Louie, how come you're not interjecting? Because all I want to say, do the work, you know? Mm. And um, you got to do P prime, U prime. You can't do gravity wave just looking at the, the surface pressure. You got to do the P prime, U prime correlation to understand that it is a wave and then which way is it going and what the, what the group velocity is, you know? You got to do all those kinds of things, mm. right? And um, people aren't doing the work on things like that. And in the mesoscale, that's, that's going to be really important, hmm. in my, my view. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So is, is there anything that we haven't touched on yet that, that maybe we wanted to bring up before we bring it to a close? The outcomes of the field programs, I think. I mean, Gale was something else. We, well, although we didn't yeah. get the bomb except for what was left on the... Uh, oh, the uh, end of the experiment? Yeah. yeah. Should we tell that story? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You yeah. go ahead and tell it. It's great. So we had this forecast office, and they had this... Uh, what year was it? Uh, this was 86. in 1986. 86. Uh, that the field program it was January to March right and it was in uh, the field office was in Raleigh it was in a National Guard building near the Raleigh Airport because they had all these airplanes running. so they had um, uh, we had a nice room they were really gracious to us they gave us a breakout rooms and all that and um, in one of the breakout rooms uh, this where they had the central round table they had this clock with like it looked like a three sticks of dynamite around but it was a clock, right? And, and underneath it, 
was we're waiting for the bomb because we wanted a major <laughs> psychogenesis and everybody, you know, and we didn't get that during right, Gale. We right. got it during Erica. But got it right after Gale ended, of course. Yeah, right. <laughs> so when the experiment was over, they cleaned out everything, but they left that behind. So when the cleaning crew came in, National Guard, and they saw this red three sticks of dynamite with a clock ticking away, <laughs> they cleaned out the whole airport. This was off of the airport. Well, you cannot believe how pissed off the National Guard was, and they never invited, we never were able to run another field experiment out of the Raleigh uh, airport again. So that was one of the things. So the, the rapid cyclogenesis, uh, we did papers on you know, light to moderate storms, and, and, uh, uh, but the rapid cyclogenesis didn't happen in Gale, and that led to the Erica experiment. But it was the same thing, you know, these, this work. Um, and by the mid-80s, we had the NGM, which was Norm Phillips. Norm Phillips, by the way, was one of the originals from the Aberdeen experiment that produced the first numerical uh, simulation of a cyclone in 1952 uh, for that November storm. Yeah, the nested grid model, yeah. or Norm's greatest yeah. models, we yeah. used to like to call it. So we had that, and we had um, the global model for the first time. Um, so we now had these models to start using and start understanding, okay, well, now you got these models, better vertical resolution, better, you're still having problems. Mm. So the physics were really emphasized. Boundary layer was really emphasized. The use of satellite data, the data assimilation became a really important part of these experiments. That became sort of the stepwise mm. then to yeah. the late 80s, early 90s, where these models started predicting these types of storms, not the magnitude necessarily, but the existence of three, four days in advance. And then we got to the superstorm in 93. I always say that the prediction of the superstorm in 93, um, the March storm, was a manifestation of all this work that preceded the 15 years. Sure, yeah. You know, uh, yeah. So. Well, I remember the, I mean, the LFM, I mean, obviously produced output and we looked at it, but I mean, what was the oh, spacing on that? We was... celebrated it. You, you know, the thing is, before the LFM, it came out in 71, all you had was Barotropic, be nice. <laughs> um, it, did, it didn't lock in over the Rocky Mountains, so it didn't have the locked in error, so that was good. Uh, and then you had the six level PE, but all you got was the 500 millibar vorticity. But high and the facts vorticity. charts, that was the, the only chart. That's all you Four panels. Zero, panels. 12, 24, and 36 hour yeah, forecast. That's all you got. And then you had to try to figure out, okay, is that, is that PVA going to be good enough to get a snowstorm up here? You know, what the heck's going on here now? Mm. So you didn't see anything like that. But it was coarse resolution, too. I mean, it had... Yeah, but this is what you live and die for as a student. You know? <laughs> this is the only thing you had to go... So you, could, you talk about arguments. We did have arguments in the facts. Right? Yeah. Learning experience, but we did have arguments. So there was so little information the to LFM go off The LFM came of. out to 24 <laughs> yeah. hours, and it had... That map, it had the 700 millibar uh, um, height field with the, with the uh, uh, RH. It had uh, 850 millibars, or a thickness field, and it had the precip. It was gold. We made yeah. sure we were in the fax room at 9 o'clock at night that that fax machine did not And you were hanging over the teletype. And we were All hanging over heads, the teletype. Hanging over the teletype. Um, that was it. One minute. Yep. So. Okay. Any other final comments, then? Just the thinking. Okay. It, was a great, not, it was a great ride, Lance, I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot, everybody. And thank you for, 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 for being here with us. It's, it's, it's really important for us, too.